Okay. Let's get started. Uh, we apologize for starting a bit late tonight. Um, thank you all for joining us. Tonight's subject is triage allocation of scarce material, um, scarce resources in Jewish thought. And we have once again Dr. Didi Schiller who's mm -hmm. joining us. Um, and uh, we're going to work through a little bit of first. Didi's going to share with us some stories of where this challenge happened and how it happened and the outcomes. And then we'll try and delve in through some Jewish sources to try and evaluate if Torah can give us a path towards clarifying or how to evaluate um, hierarchy with regards to allocation of resources. Okay. Um, so I think I'll start by saying, you know, as a physician, can you imagine being in a position where you have to choose between two people in front of you, right? So that's a difficult thing. And so one, and historically, I'll just go back to Hurricane Katrina. So around Hurricane Katrina was 2005, 2006. And I don't know if everybody remembers this story of what happened in New Orleans. So the hurricane hits. And then uh, like basically like about 30 hours later, the levee broke, right? So first you had the initial storm with its own problems. And there was a particularly, like there was a hospital right near the French Quarter, which was actually three miles below sea level. It's called Memorial Hospital. And they were doing okay. They had a generator. Okay, but then when the levee broke, the generator was too close to the ground, and so the generator went out. Now, the problem with this hospital was that it's not just a hospital. It was, there was a lot of indigent people there. They had a, what we call a long-term care unit, but for ventilated patients. So they had basically people that were probably never gonna get better. Some of them were alert, some were not. And in order to get anyone evacuated, they had to get them to the helipad, okay? So the helipad meant that you would have to take these people, these patients from the seventh floor to the first floor, then up another garage to get to the helipad, okay? And it was at the time, at, after all of the electricity went off, right? There was water surrounding them completely, right? And it was a hundred degrees and it was also very moist, like such, so much humidity. And so, and the staff that was in the hospital were stuck there, right? So they were able the first day to evacuate the women and children and they were left with quite ill people. And then some people that weren't that ill, but were kind of like on the medical ward or in the emergency room. Now, what happened was they had no discussion really of how to triage, meaning who do we give IV fluids to? Who do we give the one ventilator to? How do we allocate the resources of our nurses? Because the nurses were also really like, they were at the level where they could only take care of a few people, right? They couldn't take care of the entire place. And so, there were even some people who couldn't even make it up to that seventh floor, right? And so that was one of the, th and that physician, her name is Dr. Anna Poo, Pow, Poo, P-O-U. She was a head and neck surgeon who was actually in charge. For some reason, she was made in charge just because she was just, she, she just was good with the nursing staff, good with the administration, and she seemed to have her head on her shoulders. And so, um, before the generator blew, they had a decision made. And that decision was allocation of resources will be first to people who are healthy and doing well. Then, so they did a one, two, three. That's what they did. So they were assessing, first of all, people's just status and in terms of health. But then what they also did, which is really rare, is they basically said, if someone has a do not resuscitate order on their chart, 
of any kind, even if they're walking and talking and doing the okay, we're still going to make them a three. Because when it comes down to it, meaning we're not going to help them, we're not going to feed them, we're not going to give them water, things like that. Because when it comes down to it, if it was a matter of life or death, they wouldn't want us to do anything extenuating on their behalf. So you can imagine, and the other problem was that this, the doctors and the nurses all felt very much at risk because they knew that there was looters coming through New Orleans. And so they were worried that if they left any patients behind or left any staff behind, that they might have violent acts that would mm -hmm. occur and they might be killed. And so that is just one situation. And after Hurricane Katrina, and I don't want to get into some of the details of like all of it because I don't really think it pertains to our discussion today. Um, but the New York Times has an amazing article about it and how they eventually, uh, she was, a, the doctor was actually acquitted, even though some of it seemed glaring um, on how she chose. It was like terrible, actually. Um, some of the but it doesn't really lawsuits against her or so eventually what happened was they felt that they were they needed to allocate resources and they felt that they couldn't let people suffer so they had people on the seventh floor who were alert but yet chronically ill and they actually ended up giving them lethal doses of morphine mm -hmm. because they felt that they needed to allocate resources to the others wow. and that is it's a totally true story and but what we learned from this experience is that we need to have programs in place for every institution so that if we are kind of pushed against the wall and have to decide those allocation of resources, we would do it in an ethical way where not one physician's making all the decisions under duress. Right. So that that situation is just horrible mm -hmm. and to the extreme. I'm not sure I understand the logic. If somebody is up and around, but they have written, they, they have signed it, do not resuscitate. Where is the logic that says that it makes sense not to give them any help at all? If they're fully functioning and healthy. So the problem was that they didn't continue no, to they're they're healthy. Healthy. They didn't, they're they right. weren't right. healthy, healthy, oh, but they were and they right. weren't really right. Right. reassessing them. The other problem is that when we talk about allocation of resources, Somebody's status today might be different than yes. tomorrow. And so what also happened was some of the decision-making that they made was during the hurricane part and not during the end of the generator part. And so they didn't continue to change their parameters based on the needs of their patients. They didn't continue to reevaluate them. Can I, can I just step in over there as well? I mean, like, I think what's important to remember is like, let's say they had, they evaluated that five days worth of food. And by the, the, the evaluation is we can feed 10 people with our, with our, for five days. It's gonna take um, four days for troops to come in and bring us resources again. So now do we starve everyone and equal, equally share the food or do we allocate resources to those who most likely are gonna make it or those who, who have originally told us, you know, if the situation comes desperate, leave me alone. And they felt like they were on an island by themselves. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a story of a fam a young family with two children who come to the door. They're in a boat. They come to the door of the hospital and they're knocking and they say, we're going to die. We have no water. We have no food. Our children, we are dying. And guess what? The hospital administrator said, we're at our max. We can only take care of the people who are in here. So, you know, this is a glaring situation, but now let's fast forward to COVID-19. So COVID-19, when it initially happened, right? What happened? Everybody knew that there was a chance that you may need ventilatory support, right? And so some things can, when we talk about allocation of resources, is it something that's divisible? Like if I have a flask of water and I give you half and you half, right? But now let's take another step. Okay. It, to put someone, to ventilate someone, right? You have to have a machine. That machine is not divisible. So it just brings another problem. Also, I want you to think about the problem in the United States. We're not used to somebody saying, 
I need to choose who I am treating. Is it based on age? Is it based on performance status? Is it based on what is? Is it a lottery? Is it first come first serve? And so those are the things we're going to try to kind of talk about, both from how secular ethics looks at it and from Jewish ethics perspective. Is how do you decide? I have a quick question. Who received their vaccine before January 2021? You got yours? Did you, when did you get yours? When did I get mine? Yeah. Mine was uh, late March. March. I think I got mine in January. Yeah. You got yours in January. We got our first dose. First one in January. First one in January. <clears throat> Right. I mean, like we can clearly see how the struggle was and of when we got a we got a we got a limited amount of resources, who gets them and yeah, why do they old. get them? You get them because you're old. You got yeah. them because you're a doctor. Right. Right. White people going to black neighborhoods. White yes. people were going to black neighborhoods. Exactly. I got mine because I'm a mohel. A mohel. A mohel. Yeah. They let me. You're aggressive. Going. You're aggressive. Right. No. Yeah, when did you so know? we're going to talk about that, actually. We just, we just we're going to talk about that. Because yeah. when we talk about first come, first serve, they actually don't necessarily think that it is first come, first serve. Because usually more educated and economically sound people have closer. And computer savvy. Right. Yeah. And they're yeah. computer savvy and they can easily get those resources. Which is something to consider right. when you just say, oh, first come, first serve. Yeah, right. We know a lot of people who got it. Yeah, that's one. one thing. Um, and they really wanted to help people. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah. And one about the people who struggled? Yeah. Right. 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 And what about the people who struggled with the decision? I think there's people that are sicker than I am. Yeah. I'd rather them have it before me. Right. Everybody had this struggle. What? I, I had that struggle because I got I was in the first wave of the, of the doctors, but I don't I wasn't covering the hospital. I was more administrative, and so I wanted my my oh, neurologists who were who were seeing uh, patients to get it, but I realized that it, it wasn't going to keep coming around. So, <laughs> if you want to wipe yourself, this was the way no, it was sure. going, and this sure. is, we have extras. Okay, I have a couple. Okay. But I don't think it's it needs to be so magnified in terms of vaccines because we all knew that eventually everybody would get a chance, right? Yeah, it's very different than two people showing up and who who do you ventilate, right? Right. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, we're going to look at our resources over here, and we're going to look at the first two. We're so important to recognize how seriously we take the value of a person's life and therefore how seriously this this decision needs to be taken right um so we start with the mission in sanhedrin which talks about the sanctity of the human life and the mission tells us nibra adam yechidi man was created alone just kidding Amazing. You guys online can see the resource, yeah? yeah yes. Yes. Cool. Thank you. This is a man was created alone. Anyone who destroys one life of a single Jew, the life of a Jew, it's per, as if a person destroyed an entire world. She is in the production of Zoom. The Russian. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and the, this discussion is that we do develop, this goes into with regards to 
everyone has a hierarchy. Does, is there a hierarchy with regards to a Jew versus a non-Jew? If you just had Jews or had non-Jews, um, we're going to shelf that for now. We're going to take it as if we're going to work with, um, we said it was the Ramban, that says that one needs to treat everyone equally, whether you're Jew or not, or, or not a Jew. Okay. Now, with regards to the value of like, what if a person is in a complete vegetative state? What if a person is um, in, in a very significantly dire strait of, uh, there's no way that the person could survive. How, how aggressive, how aggressively do we treat them? Okay. And that's where we have source number two, which is a, a Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach. He died in 1993, just before Purim, actually. 1990, uh, just before Purim, 1993, Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach. by the way, I'll tell you a phenomenal story. Um, I'm really sidetracking for a minute, <laughs> okay. But Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach was one of those few funerals where the entire Bar Ilan was shut down for the funeral. Bar Ilan is one of the very main streets, which they'll try and avoid to whatever degree, avoid shutting, shutting down Bar Ilan Street uh, for is even for a funeral. And his for his funeral, they talk they talk about about half a million people attended his funeral. Shlomo mm -hmm. Zamarovak was known as the one person that he he uh, phenomenal Torah sage, and yet he, he was all about peace and having good relationships across the board within the Israeli society. Um, so over here, he, said, he writes, this is one of his, his responses. We have no way of measuring the value of life. Regarding the matter of life, we have no means of measuring its worth and importance, not even from the standpoint of Torah and mitzvahs. We must violate the Shabbos even for an elderly, ill man, even if he's a person, even if he's completely insane and deaf and cannot perform a single mitzvah, even if his life is a massive load and burden upon his family, which distracts him from Torah and mitzvot and adds to their troubles. Even in such a case, the greatest among Israel are commanded to make efforts and get involved and he's healing and violate the Shabbos to save his life. Okay. And, and, and the stories are numerous, whereby I believe um, at the time it was in Europe, <coughs> there was a student in uh, Slobodka who was not well. They called the doctor. The doctor needed more light. And the Rosh Shiva, the Alt of Slobodka, he went and he flipped, flipped the switch. It was on Shabbos. And the students who why didn't you let someone who why didn't you could have called a, called someone who's not Jewish to flip the switch? Why didn't what do we he was like, I need to give you a message. You have to realize the value of a person's life, a person who's in danger, we just completely push away the Shabbos and we'll we'll take care of, of whatever needs to be taken care of. Um, but I think that the secondary goal of this passage is also that it's very difficult in Judaism to quantify what that life is. That person's debilitated, they're elderly, they might be very, they might not have their wits about them. Are they considered less than somebody else, right? And so Judaism doesn't really try to tell you what the quality of that life so a very interesting thought about it is that I was reading some of the articles about secular ethics. So there's a famous article written by this guy named Prasad. And he said, we could do, we can look at different values to see how we look at this allocation of resources. One, is it a lottery system, right? Just a straight up lottery. Two people are in front of you, you flip a coin and that person wins. Okay, well, the problem with that is you're not really taking anything else into account, right? And then the other one would be something like, you know, first come, first serve. Well, we said it before, first come, first serve might benefit those that are wealthy, right? Or who live closer to the hospital or have pull, right? Then another one would be, maybe we should favor the worst off, 
I'll give you an example of that. Last time we came, we talked about organ transplantation, right? Favoring the worst off today means that we have a list of the sickest people who need livers, right? They're in liver failure. The sickest ones are at the top. Why is that? It's only if you know you're going to replenish the resource that you can do the worst off. Okay, COVID-19 really doesn't, it doesn't play, right? Because everyone had the possibility of getting sick quickly and everybody had the possibility of respiratory failure quickly, right? So we don't really do that one. The, then the last two are the ones that we, they kind of lean towards and Judaism will show you also kind of leans towards those two. One is utilitarianism. How do we help the most people in our society? Right. And then another part of that utilitarianism is should we give precedence to people who have more social usefulness? For example, a vaccine to a physician, right? Versus to a 20 year old, right? So th these are kind of like the different ideas behind how we look at resources and how we, now is Judaism on the same page. Well, the, this one resource that we just read should take you to the point where we have a very hard time saying one Jew is not worth more than another. For example, an autistic 10-year-old versus a healthy 10-year-old, how do you choose? Should you choose based on who's more intellectually intelligent or not? And Judaism would probably not say. I mean, to, that becomes a very slippery slope. It you does. can go straight to what happened in Europe, where they were just like evaluating, well, these are the ideal people and these are not. And we're just right. cleaning exactly. up our society in order just to have a clean, healthy, ideal society. You've also told us that there is purpose and mission that is a part of this that we can't hope to understand. Somebody who is attenuated, who is on the verge of dying, maybe if you look at the world to come in this world, it may be fulfilling something that is hugely important, regardless of how how bad his health may be. Right. Agree. I, I think another thing that needs to be taken in, into account is there's there's also a weight with regards to if I if I give allocate resources to one versus sharing that resource. Um, do I carry a, um, a, um, a responsibility with regards to the life that got lost? Meaning, is it considered murder by withholding um, food or whatever to someone? Right? Is that considered murder from a Torah perspective? Right? That, is, that is where the weight comes in. It's like, if I am able to share something and I give it to one, have I do I carry weight with, with that regard? Clearly, the Torah looks looks from that perspective. I I, I just want to give give the the the, the source where Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach comes from with regards to talking about how we have no way of measuring the value of life and how important the value of life is. But it comes from a Gemara. So you're not allowed to um, move rubble on Shabbos. If one had a wall, the wall fell. I was not allowed to remove move rubble on remove rubble and Chavez it falls under the category the prohibition called bone of, of, of building um anyways we're not allowed to do it it's a prohibition now there's a person missing in your town a wall fell out, fell down on Chavez you're not sure if the person is there or not so now we called something called a suffolk it's a a doubt a doubt thank you it's we're, we're not sure if there's a person or not now do you does one uh, uh, sacrifice the value, the, the importance of Shabbos when you got some when something is a doubt? What if there's a very small chance it is? The Gemara says clearly we we we, we disregard Shabbos in order to attempt to find the person, even if there's a small chance that the person is there. So clearly the Torah is giving a very strong precedence with regards to giving allocating resources in order to attempt to save a life okay so now we're going to get to the next step where 
where you have a limited resource, and it's actually a Gomorrah involvement. Yeah. I, I digress for a second. But you bring up an issue of, of giving someone sustenance when they don't have the resources to do so. Um, and I think that brings up the issue of. Is hospice halakhically okay? Because you're withdrawing something for someone where they could be versus maybe putting them on a ventilator or some kind of. Uh, okay, of, uh, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So the truth is, we are now talking about allocation of resources. Once you give someone a life saving resource in Judaism, you cannot take it away. So there's a difference between withholding versus removing big difference mm -hmm. so if two people are in front of you you choose someone to give the ventilator to but that person's not doing great and the president of the united states walks in and you need that person's ventilator you can't take them off it. now for you for but for the hospice patient someone who ha is likely to pass soon in the near future not necessarily withholding, but not initiating life-saving things is probably okay in Judy. Taking account the patient's For sure. For sure. That really comes into play. We don't let them kill themselves. No. No. We don't let someone actively take their own lives. But in Judaism, if someone says, I don't want life sustaining things to be done to me, it's some people, and this is kind of gets into our discussion from last month. Some will say you can withhold, some will say not. It depends on which rabbi you are following, truthfully. We will get into that. That we will, will be one of our next discussions. Um, DNR. Okay, so here we have our case where we have a limited resource. So the, the, the Talmud, we, we're going to initiate where one person has the limited resource, does he have an obligation to share it or not? Okay, and that's this famous Gemara in Bab Metziah. But there are two people walking in the way, and one of them is a flask of water. If both of them drink, if they both share it, they both die. However, if one drinks it, he'll, if he keeps the resource to himself, he'll be able to make it to a settlement. Darash Ben Putur. So now let's just work through very slowly how the Gemara analyzes. Ben Putur, this is one of the first few times that this individual is mentioned, and he gives us a a, a basis, okay? And ben Pator is much greater than Rabbi Akiva and senior than Rabbi Akiva. He says, Rather, share it, both die. And let one not see the death of his friend. So Ben Pator is giving a logical explanation that if you and your friend have a limited resource, you, didn't, you share it. It's much worse to see a fellow person die because of your action. And it is worthwhile to even die, according to Ben Pater, than both of you, then one of you pull it for yourself. That was how, that was, that was the precedent of how to deal with this case. And this lasted until Rabbi Akiva came. And our Akiva is a later generation than Ben Petura. He was of a lower generation, lower with great status and greatness. And he said, the limate, and he taught a logical understanding of the verse. And it says, your brother shall live with you, which means with you, meaning I have an obligation to save my brother's life but only if we're both going to survive. Your life takes precedence over his life. Meaning you have an obligation to save your fellow. That is as long as it's not at the cost of your own life. 
That was Rabbi Akiva. So Ben Petur gave this, this precedent that said, we don't touch. We don't go and try and save one life versus the other. It's worse to see a person rather, rather, rather die than see your fellow pass away, right? uh, than see your friend die. And Rabbi Akiva says, you have an obligation to save your life, meaning to share your resource as long as it's not going to affect your own life. Okay. Now, clearly what we see is what the Gemara is talking about is talking about who has the resource, right? The Gemara says, you are, are, you are holding on to the resource. It's not a third party is holding on to the resource and needs to divide it. It's you holding, you're the, um, got a better word? The, the keeper, keeper of the, the gatekeeper. <laughs> you're the keeper of the resource, okay? So you're holding on to it. You're the owner of that. And do you have an obligation to share it? Ben Petura thinks yes, even at the cost of your own life. Well, is it better to save two lives for a short amount of time versus one for a longer amount? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there is something qualitative right? just by degree for so those two because a little longer is not a lifetime after you get through the crisis. It's true. It's true. And the truth is, ben, the way Ben Petura is looking at it is the moral action of withholding from your friend will hurt you morally mm -hmm. for time. It's the action, not the consequence. Rabbi Akiva is looking at the consequence, who lives, and how do we preserve life versus the action. Okay. So Akiva says it's okay to do it to save yourself. Correct. He to says you yourself. should. Without you should. any consideration of are there kids and are there more responsibilities or none of that counts. It doesn't say it in this yeah, thing. Yeah, right, right. Understood. Rabbi Akiva felt your life take, at the end of that Gemara says, your life takes precedence over your brother and you save yourself. Hear stories about an 85 year old rabbi or priest uh, saying, Here, took my life. You know, I know I'm supposed to save my own, but I'm 85. He says, So you can't, can you, I should say, give it up? What did you do? You know what you did. Could you give all the water to the other person? That yeah, you're right. You have to be 95. 95. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but then the even harder story is is the Chazanish, yeah. which is Chazanish. which is so the Chazanish, he was actually contemporary, he 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 passed in 1962. Chazanish was actually contemporary and wrote a numerous response of Rosh Hashanah Zaman Orbach, who was the earlier quote. Um and Rosh Hashanah Zaman Orbach, he was one of the earliest developers with regards to halachic guidance, how to deal with uh, electricity on Shabbos. And there are numerous famous responses between Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orach and the Chazon Ish with regards to dealing with, with electricity, just point that, point that out. And the Chazon Ish is, was seen as, uh, he moved to Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel in the early uh, 1900s. And he was there throughout, he was mainly the, the main Torah scholar, Torah sage of of the land of Israel. So he was asked on this Gemara, uh, what do you do if a third party has it? Okay, third party is holding the resource. So I have enough, let's just work it through. I have enough water for myself. I have enough for one more person and I'm accompanying two individuals. What do I do with the water? Do I split it? Do I throw it in the air and, and let them fight over it? Or do I allocate it with one individual? Okay. Now the Chazon Ish, what he goes and does, which is so typical of the Chazon Ish, what we try and do is always try and find a precedent and then follow a logic within that precedent. Okay, so work out that logic and then try and copy it with another case. That's exactly what the Chazon Ish goes and does. He says as follows. It appears that if a third party has water and two thirsty people are before him, 
The halacha depends on the same dispute. According to Ben Petura, the water is given to both and both will die. For even if he gives the water to one of them, this is where the larger comes. Why do you give it to both, according to Ben Petura? Because if you were to give it to one of them, what is that person's obligation according to Ben Petura? He has to share it. So why does it make any difference if you give it to one person or give you the, if that person has to share it or you share it, according to Ben Petura, you'd share it. Um, but according to Rabbi Akiva, he should give the water, the water to whomever he chooses. You get to make that choice. Though the third party is not under the instruction of your life takes precedence, I have enough water for my own self. Okay. Now my question is, who do I give it to? Do I give it to party A or party B? Now there's no threat that mitzvah of your life takes precedence doesn't help, doesn't happen over here. I'm, look, I've got my, my life is taken care of, right? So who do we choose? The person he gives it to will justifiably save himself. So if I give it to party A, then they'll save themselves. Give it to party B, they'll save themselves from a halachic perspective, according to Rabbi Akiva, right? And it's therefore permitted to give the water to him. Moreover, it seems that the third party is obligated to give the water to one of them because the instruction of your life takes precedence implies that one's person, one person's long-term life takes precedence over both of their short-term lives. And this is a new concept that we're going to discuss. We'll, we'll, we'll develop that a little bit. Um, but it's this concept of a long-term life versus a short-term life. In the, 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 the Gemara's language, it's called Chaye Olam, an eternal life, versus Chaye Shah, a temporary life, okay? When you got an option of two temporary lives versus one eternal life, that changes how one deals with the situation. So that comes to the, uh, to the issue of a medical Somebody that has, say, enough plasma to save one person. That's the hard part. So according to this one, Choose it one. sounds like somebody makes a decision. What that decision is based on is difficult, right? Because a lot of the Rebbeans say, can you really say that one person's blood is redder than another person's blood? That's, that's one of the, the concepts that we talk about when we discuss that. It's really complicated. It's really difficult. Is it to do the rabbis talk about students who are yet versus the Actually, not really. Um, when you really look at what we do in exile, it's if we live in a, a country where Jews live with non-Jews, then we, they are still in the same mix, that we don't give precedence over one or the other. And even on Shabbos, we can also save a non-Jewish. That's from like the basics that we looked at when we were looking at this. You don't know who the Jew, Jewish soul is. You, just, you, know, you might not. But let's say you do. It's very, I mean, like, for example, doctors that have to work on Shabbos, right? They don't go and make a choice whether they're going to work for Jews or for non-Jews. We, we accept across the board that if one's going to save a life, we save all lives. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is what we do today. Although nowadays, doctors take the, you know, all the non-Jewish holidays, and they That's manipulate it from their perspective. In Israel, it's much more complicated. You know? <laughs> Everyone wants Yom Tavok. Everyone's willing to work on Christmas. <laughs> but one of the things that we've done in the hospital is that in order to take some of this moral dilemma off of our shoulders, hmm. we've created ethics of ethics, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that that woman in New Orleans who was making most of those decisions by herself the moral weight of those decisions was so significant, right? So what we do now is we kind of try to find algorithms that we can follow to make things easier. For example, during COVID, we followed some of these like guidelines 
that were instituted by some of the internal medicine boards created some of these like programs where, okay, person A comes to the ER and their pulse ox is very low and they have other risk factors that would make them, you know, possibly, right, have a lower, a lower percentage of chance of surviving, then that person gets less resources in the ER, even before they get to the ICU. You know, so they, they tried to have these like mini algorithms so that the physician wasn't constantly bombarded with ethical decisions throughout the day. It was too difficult. And also I think it makes it much, much harder for a physician to live with the decisions. Much it's, it takes that weight. Of right, it takes it. So the, um, I, I don't know. Yeah. So the, the, it came up in, in the 50s, Israel had a limited amount of penicillin and there were numerous children in hospital. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? Um, okay. Um, wait, so so uh, basically, uh, <laughs> no. Yes, it is. Yeah. So basically, Rabbi Herzog, who was the chief rabbi of Israel at the time, he sent the question to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and he said, how do we allocate this resource? And Ramosha Feinstein, like Ramosha Feinstein said, you walk into your ward and the first child that you come that that you you meet is the one that gets that resource. Even if one of the children is cognitively impaired. Right. Right. Going back to kind of what we talked about earlier. Right? right? Yeah. So in the sense that puts it in the shape. Sorry, I had that. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. That's usually the first come first serve. It kind of is, but then again, also, I mean, look, they looked at it here in the United States. They looked at it in the Supreme Court also. What they said was, we can't say that just because someone has met significant mental or physical disabilities, that they shouldn't be saved, that we shouldn't do anything life-saving for them. Um, and actually it's against the Disabilities Act to make choices in a hospital setting based on someone's disability. More of a lottery. More of a lottery. You walk in. You yeah. yeah. So right. in other words, if you're in a hospital, you'll always be near the door. <laughs> the front door. Right. So, so this, this is very common in the ER. I don't know, very common. But this case happened. Um, two ambulances brought in two people who were, who were shot. Who were shot. One a cop. And the other... The thief who shot at the rock who shot at the police, and they both needed the ER room, and there was one room available. And then the head of the ER needs to make that decision. Well, the classic, the classic thing. Those of us who watch Nash, right? I mean, that was the, the it was just so brutal during the war and to make those decisions. In the spot, you don't have enough to make. You just have to fill. You only have twelve thousand pads to put over the blood. You have two hundred. You know, it's that was the real the hardest thing and probably is going on right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And then most famously, you have in, during the Second World War in the Warsaw Ghetto, <laughs> where the people in charge were given that responsibility of rounding up the elderly and the children, and they knew where they were going. And the thing was, either you collect them, and if you don't, you will be on the next train yourself. And how does one, mm -hmm. how does one um, you know, make that decision? Um, does one, does one not? So, so this is coming up to our next, our, our next. And, and, and the following is, um, the next resource is, that what we call the three cardinal sins. The three cardinal sins are what? Murder, Murder adultery, adultery, and idolatry. And idolatry. Idolatry. 
adultery and idolatry, murder, idol adultery, and idolatry. Mm -hmm. We call them cardinal sins, which means that if your life is being threatened against doing one of these three, Ramam says, and they learned it from the Mishnah, that we rather sacrifice your life than to do any of these three. And here it goes. A certain person, that's the bottom of the source, a certain person came before Rabbi and told him, the governor of my village said to me, kill such and such a person or else I will kill you. Rabbi replied to him, let yourself be killed and do not kill him. Who says that your blood is redder? Maybe that, man, that man's blood is redder. So now, what's the difference between Rabbi Rabbi was much later than Rabbi Akiva. What's the difference between Rabbi and Rabbi Akiva? What did Rabbi Akiva say? Save yourself. You save yourself. And what is Rabbi saying? Let yourself be killed. Let yourself be killed. So what's the difference? Why is the person the active? The active. Somebody is, is taking affirmative action to, to generate that conclusion rather than being a passive victim of circumstance. Affirmative action versus passive. Exactly. Right? If I'm not going and actively murdering someone, but I'm, re I'm withholding a resource from them, that thereby causing the death, that is much less from Robert's, Robert's, Robert's it's much less worth than uh, of seriousness than going and actively going and killing someone, causing a person to death. Here we have, um, so we have Ramosha Feinstein. And Ramosha Feinstein, he died in 1986. He was the time, so before the, we had the Chazonish and Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Arach, who lived in Israel, who lived in Israel during the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And Ramosha Feinstein, he died in 86, and he was a preeminent Torah scholar of America, of the United States. He wrote, there are seven, eight volumes now of his responsa, Moshe Feinstein's responsa. And here we have his responsa with regards to how to evaluate the importance of life. Um, in order to understand, to get a bit of context with regards to Moshe Feinstein, I'm gonna talk about, give a bit of uh, an understanding of the background of what's happening. So this is the story, the story of Sheva ben Bichri. Sheva ben Bichri, is an individual who lived at the time of King David. King David was the ruler of the land of Israel. Sheva ben Bichri did a crime against the king and was deserving of being put to death. And King David needed to establish, establish his monarchy. And therefore his army went to find Sheva ben Bichri and to have him put to death. He was deserving of the death penalty, he was going to be put to death. Sheva ben Bichri, uh, his, David's army were, um, went to find him. What this guy went and did, Sheva ben Bechri, was he went and took, uh, he went and hid himself within, behind the cities of, behind the walls of a city in, in the land of Israel. And David's army came and surrounded the city. And they said, give us over Sheva ben Bechri, give him over to us. So what is their obligation? Let's work with what we have so far. And if you don't give them to us. And if you don't give them to us, well, let's just start with that. Okay. Let's just start with that. Give them over to us. Do you give them over or do you not give them over? Knowing that he's going to be killed. Is the reason why they want to kill him, does that have relevance? You think so? <laughs> because that, that wasn't part of the way. It was not. So without a consideration of the reason for correction is what to do. Right. Well, let's just pull out. What did Rabbo say? What did Rabbo say when a person was told, go and kill someone or be killed? You have to be killed. You be killed. Okay. But we saw that Rabbi Akiva said, look after your own resources. I, there's one more quote, which actually says that, there's a group of people that are traveling and they were surrounded by, by, uh, by bandits and the bandits said, give us one person and we'll kill him or we'll kill all of you. We don't give them. We don't give that individual up. We don't give the individual up. Even more so, the Rambam actually says that if a group of women 
for cities surrounded by, by bandits and they ask for a, one person, one woman, and to want to, to violate, we don't give up a single woman. Rather, the entire group should, be, should sacrifice themselves and be put to death than giving over one woman to be violated. So it's hard to be a Jew. <laughs> so much so, I want to tell you just one more. I know I'm getting sidetracked over here, but I just so much so the 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 Ramam actually says that if a woman comes forth and she says, "I'm willing to allow myself to be violated," send me. We don't give her over, even if she was a prostitute her entire life. We do not give her over because perhaps her action is an action of teshuva that she is repentant, and you don't know the power of teshuva to evaluate whether you can sacrifice a woman's life or not. Phenomenal, powerful thing. Okay, so. Let's get back to Sheva ben Bichri. What happened with Sheva ben Bichri was um, the, the city were not sure whether to give him over or not. And a woman, they say, the Gemara says, it was a very wise woman. She came and explained. She said, we're all going to die. He's for sure going to die. We should rather give him over and not all die together. Okay. So Re Re Moshe Feinstein explains the, the logic a little bit behind what Sheva ben Bichri is the decision behind that is as follows. Okay. But if it is unclear, it, sorry, if it is clear that they will all be, that they all will. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just want to make sure that it's translated. If it's clear, I'm going to read the here. I'm going to translate from the, if it's clear that they all will die, like the situation of Sheva ben Bichri, Lachar, after a number of hours, days, or months, when Yav will catch up to him, it is therefore found that they are merely chasing him over a temporary life while he is chasing them over an eternal life. What we're what Ramoshe is bringing is that we have, what's the word? Shana. No, uh, the, when it's someone wants to, kill, wants to kill you, it's coming to kill you. Rode. 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 We've got the case of Rode. So he's introducing the kinds of Rode. By Shavu ben Bichri coming and taking hide and, and moving into the, into the city, he becomes a rodent. He's causing them to be killed. Okay, so can I say, hey, I'm going to kill you before I get killed by your action? So that's what Rav Moshe Fine says of you. When Yav will catch up to him, is it okay? So and there is no question he was going to die. Exactly. Who? Shavu ben Bichri. Ben Bichri. There was no question whether they caught up to him today. Or in a month, he was going to be put to death. Right. Right. I mean. That Jew was a rodent. Say it again. In a non-Jewish, okay. a non-Jewish farmer, a non-Jewish German, is housing a Jew. Right. The Nazis come over and they say, "This is your question, right? Yeah. We know he's in your basement. If right. you don't hand him over, we're killing the whole family." Right. That's the Sheva Ben Bichri's story. Mm. Again, I mean, they well, they didn't even it, it, during the war. If even if they had the child or the family, they were going to kill them on contact when they had. I mean, there was no like going to be no discussion whether or not they were going to kill them if they were harboring Jews. That's for sure. So. The situation it's, it's, it's that's being dilemma. described is the story of Sheva Ben Bichri. Right. It really is. So there's an elegant answer you guys are holding. 
Okay, here it goes. So Ramosha yeah. introduces this concept of Chaye Sha, a, temp a temporary life versus a long term life. Okay, and he says what's happening over here is we have Sheva Ben Bechri, his life is what we call a temporary life. It makes no difference where he goes. Yoav will catch him. Yoav, King, uh, King David's uh, officer, is going to catch him and he will kill Sheva Ben Bechri. Sheva Ben Bechri is definitely on a, a hit list. He's on a, 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 a clock, a short a dead time. Man a dead man walking. There we go. A dead yes. man walking. Exactly. Or what we'll call someone with a terminal illness. Okay? To translate it to make it more palatable for us. Someone who's definitely going to die in a short period of time. However, everyone else, as long as Sheva Ben Bichri is, as long as Sheva Ben Bichri is in their town, everyone else is a dead man walk. However, if you take Sheva Ben Bichri out of the situation, your lifespan turns from a chaye a temporary life, to a long term life. Okay. So what Sheva Ben Bichri is doing is he's being a road against that long term period of life. While what is being sacrificed is Sheva Ben Bichri's short term life. And that's what this wise woman at the time said let us give him over because his life is a short term life, anyways, versus us losing our long term life because of Sheva Ben Bichri. Would you mind reading? Okay. I am. Okay. Which one? My friends. I don't know. Um, which part? Okay, um, when Yoav will catch up to him, it is therefore found that they are merely chasing him over a temporary life, while he is chasing them over an eternal life. We therefore find that regarding the essence of the rest of their lives, he is chasing them while about that, his eternal life, they are not chasing him at all. In this regard, he has a law of a road date, even though this is not his intent, and this is a clear, correct reasoning. So what they determined was that Sheva ben Bechri was essentially a rodev and that his life was short term anyway, so that to save the lives of the city, they could actually give him over. So they should give over to let him lose it. And Which seems so like something that you would never ever expect, right? Because there were other situations in King David's life. I don't know if you remember, King David was running away from Saul, right? And he went to a Kohan, Kohen city. Right. What was it? Like, it was like a little a city that... Uh, he went to a city that was, was like a group of Kohanim, right? Yeah. And so they actually were threatened. Like, okay, King David is here. Saul had this mental instability where he was obsessed with killing David. There were certain times where he was obsessed with it and certain times where he wasn't obsessed with it. And it wasn't definite that David did anything that warranted him to be killed, right? He just was in Saul's way, right? So in that situation, that group of Kohanim couldn't give David away. David ended up running away, right? Right. No, he 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 ran away and they killed the entire city. They Saul did kill home. the whole. Yeah, he did. They did kill the entire. But city. But they weren't going to give David him. to Saul. That's a precedence, also. Actually, it's kind of interesting because in ethics, there's a discussion of a trolley car. Okay, mm -hmm. so you have two trolleys. It's kind of like one of these accidents can happen, right? So you know that you can only save one trolley if you flip a switch. In one trolley, you have 10 people. In one trolley, you have one people, one person. Can you flip the switch to make that decision? And should the switch be in favor of the group of people, right? So that's the greater good is surviving. Well, then we could take it a different way, right? Let's say in that trolley car, 
you have terminally ill cancer patients that only have the ability to live for a very short time, for the next two, three years, right? And the other person is a healthy person. Okay, so now you're talking not in terms of not numbers of people, but quality years of people, right? So does the fact that this 30 year old who's very healthy in one trolley car trump the 10 years left of those 10 people who are, right? So now you have a decision as to trolley and clicking a signal and that is based on years of life of quality. Something to think about. So like, so basically when, what ends up happening, well, I think we're gonna, yeah, we so, have more. so that's, that's just going we have more we'll, to get there. We'll, we'll pull out that Shabbat and Bethany situation. And what Rabbi Moshe Feinstein is, is, is expressing is this difference between Chai Shah and Chai Olam. An eternal life, a temporary life versus an eternal life. Meaning, if I have an option of giving someone a, an extension of a certain number of hours versus using that same resource and giving someone an eternal life, years more right that what i'm able to do is i'm able to look at am i able to save an extended period of life am i able to allocate a resource in order to save an extended period of time of life and that's the precedent that we have with shabba ben and um so i'm just going to read over here the, the trans the hebrew it's right at the bottom um <clears throat> so um, here, where it's really only partial life, it's temporary life, it's not the same as murdering any a regular person. So now, if you have unlimited resources, right, we have an obligation to save a person even temporarily or extending their life, even for a number of hours, we have an obligation to do so as long as it's not causing an extensive pain, okay? But if I have the option of allocating a resource and I have an extension over here and, extend, and much longer an eternal life, then we give that to the eternal life. Since I'm not able to save an, a Temp a temporary life. I can't save it in a long-term way without He's going back to Sheva Ben Bechri, that one, a short-term life gets pushed away versus the eternal life of the other people. You know the problem is with that? After they make that decision, the guy could get off the trolley and get hit by the car. <laughs> they can, correct. But what would you say to that? I, we don't rely on miracles. We don't rely on miracles, right? So if you right. think back to the story of the canteen, right? You have two people in the desert. One person owns the canteen. Ben Petura says, I can't deal with my moral action. I will share it with my friend, even if that means both of us will die. And who knows? Maybe in three hours, it'll rain or they'll find some water somewhere right none we jews don't believe in like lightning striking we believe that we have to make yeah. sound decisions based on science and logic and we don't believe in you know you know a miracle we can't deal with the what ifs right right so let's just go back play back one more time. Now we have like a bit of a precedent with regards to what Moshe Feinstein gave us. You got two patients and you've got one um, machine. Ventilator. ventilator. You've got two patients, one ventilator. They both need it equally. One is terminally ill, one is not. From what we've seen so far, it would seem that Moshe Feinstein would be okay. But first of all, you do get to make that choice. 
right? We saw that from the Chazon Ish, that if you have one thing of water, you allocate it to one person. You don't say, I can't make this decision, it's too difficult to decide. I'm not going to make it, I'm just going to, we don't say we fight it out. You do get to make that choice. Now we have another additional precedent with regards to, you can allocate it to someone who's got a chance, who's not terminally ill versus the one who's terminally ill. What does medicine say about that? That's called utilitarianism. So that's the idea that we should give the resource to the person who could benefit the most from it. And okay, truthfully, person is diminished. Yeah. Person is going to live, but he's diminished. He's in a vegetative state. So, so unfortunately, in, in New Orleans, that said, well, those people that said that they do not resuscitate. They've made a choice. So this person, let's say one person on the ventilator, there's a choice between two. One says do not do not resuscitate. The other one says do whatever you, you can do, even though that one is more likely to live. The one that uh, the one that says that they don't want to have everything you know, they, that they would want to, yeah, but they wouldn't want to do everything. You give it to the other one. Well, the problem with their premise was that they didn't evaluate people as time went on. Right. So really a do not resuscitate is for an acute situation. Somebody's in the throes of death, please allow natural death. Right. They shouldn't have used it as a criteria for long term life. Right. It, that's the problem with their premise. But going back to your idea of what do you do if someone's in a vegetative state, but will probably live five years. Right. Versus a healthy person who will also live at least five years, right? And they both need that ventilator, right? Is that what you're asking? Okay. <laughs> is that, that is what you're asking, right? So um, today, it, I mean, according to our laws, and this actually also is true, if someone has a mental disability or physical disability, just because of that disability, regardless of the fact that they that if that's the only difference, you would then have to do it based on a lottery or first come first serve. Well, they have a CMR or, or they have a... If that person wanted to... Uh, yeah. So they don't want to live in a vegetative state or they don't want to go on dialysis. Or... Then you can respect it. Then you can respect it. But if you had to allocate a ventilator to two people and one of them was, you know, deaf and autistic, and the other one was totally fine. It would probably be a first come first serve versus uh, or a lottery system. That's how you would have to do it. If the person has a DNR and an EMT comes to the H O U S E and <laughs> and uh, puts him on life support. When he gets to the hospital, it can't be taken off, even if he has a DNR. No, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, it's very interesting from a halachic perspective in Israel, they have a system with regards to running. At how do you? So, you can't, you can't take them off life support, let's say. Um, but you don't have to change, let's say, a person on a oxygen tank. Do you transfer? or attach the oxygen tank to the central system with regards to um, <coughs> it, if they're in a DNR situation. So that is a massive halakhic situation in the early 80s where there were wheeling tanks all over, the, all over the hospitals. So then it was much simpler with regards to you just don't change the tank and let, it, let the air run out versus now it became more complicated and, and they have to put in, put in situ um, loopholes in the, in the system whereby a person's oxygen is, is, runs out by itself versus actively going in and, and switching something off. Actively going and switching something off is much worse from a total perspective than just allowing it to expire. So what you need to do is fix your supply chain <laughs> you know, it was really interesting when I was reviewing for this talk, one of the things I read was about the laws in Israel. 
And so you know how here you have Good Samaritan laws to protect people who perform CPR on someone they find in the middle of the street, right? But the person has the ability to say, I don't want to really get involved. Like, you know, I'm sorry that you're laying there about to die, but you know what? Maybe you have HIV or I don't want to be blamed for breaking your ribs. I'm just going to walk away. That's okay. In Israel, they actually passed a law that said you can't walk away. If you walk away, you are a criminal. I thought that was fast. So does that mean you have to do something or you just can call? You have to do something. You have to assist in some way. You can't just walk off. Assist, but you call the authorities. You might not know how to do CPR. You okay. might not, but you have to do what you can with the resources you have to assist that person. You can't just not walk away. assist. I thought that was really interesting. So I think it was lo talmud al dam So that that's the idea is that you can't stand by and watch a fellow person die. So that's the premise. Conscience of civilization. <laughs> the fact that we have to have a law for that is pretty sad. But <laughs> I mean, it's people dying too. I mean, well, it says what the society felt was important. What's the Hippocratic Oath say? You have to. You have to. You have to. Right. Do no harm. Yeah, do no harm. Do but no also, harm. We, but do also have, we have to kick. We, we do have to help. So it's People who have taken the Hippocratic Oath have to. But human beings have a responsibility to other right. human beings. So. What? Well, but you know, societies, oh. if you look at the grand scheme of things, what is conventional and moral at one stage of the world is not the really other. So it's, it's never simple. It's never simple. No, these are such hard discussions. I can't even imagine the Holocaust mm -hmm. or some of these situ 